for the next 15 minutes or so, I, I, I'm going to discuss what we are doing in my research group, which is in McEwan University. My name is Samuel Mugo, and today I'm going to talk to you about uh, our work on fabricating microneedles, uh, where we print uh, multi-responsive hydrogel materials and then we use um, those fabricated uh, platforms uh, for chemical analytics. Now, wh whether we are dealing with animals or plants, all of us, you know, tend to respond uh, to stress in very similar ways, possibly due to evolutionary convergence. And plants and animals, you know, produce different types of metabolites um, uh, as a result of uh, be it biotic or uh, abiotic uh, stresses. And these metabolites are what uh, our interests are in terms of fabricating sensors that can be used to detect these metabolites uh, that can be used as indicators uh, of stress, be it for plants as well as, uh, as well as animals. And some of the metabolites that we are interested in include things like hydrogen peroxide, which is the most stable reactive oxygen species out there. Also interested in different types of electrolytes, um, interested in adrenaline, cholesterol, and so on. But today my focus is going to be mainly on dissolved oxygen. I'm also going to talk a little bit about uh, hydrogen peroxide. Also, maybe I'm going to give an example of cortisol, which is probably the most predominant of uh, the stress hormones out there. And I'm going to talk about pH and redox potential, two of which I consider to be the most important types of uh, chemical equilibria out there that can be used uh, to be bulk indicators of, uh, of, of stress uh, of stress metabolites. Now, the analytical challenge out there is, you know, we want to get away from these very expensive types of chemical analytical platforms that are localized in the labs, things like gas chromatography, things like um, uh, spectroscopies and so on, when they are very, very robust and, and, and so on. Unfortunately, they are very expensive and you cannot take them to the field. Now, the future of chemical analysis is where we democratize it to fabricate uh, small platforms that are frugal, uh, that can analyze uh, the, um, the, the chemical species very rapidly. And also very important, you know, that do not disturb the specimen that is being studied. And so you can do what we call the in situ, non-invasive type of analysis. And as such, you can take these types of platforms in the field and hopefully you can also hyphenate them, you know, to cellular platforms so that you can, um, you can do data analysis that way. What we are referring to as the Internet of Things, really, which is the future of chemical analysis, as far as, you know, helping consumers make decisions uh, from the data that is generated uh, from these chemical uh, uh, platforms. And so sort of, you know, this is the future where we are getting these uh, platforms that are uh, embedded with all these type of um, uh, uh, types of features and indeed you know that is our goal you know to create mainly electrochemical platforms you know that embody all these types of features essentially so that we can democratize chemical analysis and and get these platforms out in the field instead of bringing the sample into the lab now, very quickly, the different types of architectural platforms that we fabricate includes the planar types of sensors, but you also fabricate um, the penetrative, you know, types of sensors which comprises microneedles. That's very important if at all we want to very non-invasively uh, penetrate, you know, be it plants or even uh, animals so that we can sample uh, biological specimen that may not be on the surface, you know, for humans, it could be things like the interstitial fluid, and for plants, it could be things like the apoplastic fluids, you know, that are just below 
are inside uh, the, 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 the back of, this, uh, of, the, of the plant. And, and so we normally use the PDMS to fabricate these things we are calling the flexible platforms. They can be non-penetrative, meaning we don't have micro needles, but also we can fabricate the PDMS, which is a flexible platform and integrate micro needles, which looks something like this. And we actually do that using very inexpensive uh, platforms um, created using actually a beeswax mold but again i don't have a lot of time to talk about that you're gonna see in the literature the way they fabricate these micro needles is very time consuming but my group has again developed a very inexpensive and simple way of fabricating pdms micro needles uh, using a mold such as uh, such as a beeswax other than the flexible sensors, you know, we also use the rigid types of uh, micro needles, again, very simply using the hypodermic needles, and then we coat inside, um, you know, with the molecular receptors uh, that uh, can be used uh, to detect uh, the analytes of interest. And lastly, we also use a textile-based uh, types of uh, flexible uh, materials, and this is essentially just cotton. And then we modify it using different types of um, conductive materials that I'm going to talk about later. So very quickly, well, you know, for a sensor to be useful, it needs a selective biomimetric, you know, receptor, which is what we normally ourselves are interested in, things that are receptors or molecular receptors that are very, very stable environmentally. And so again, it makes it easy, you know, to take these types of platforms in the field. And so despite the fact that in my past, we've done a lot of work with enzymes, we've done a lot of work with optimas. Again, all these are very selective uh, types of molecular receptors, but unfortunately enzymes, again, they are very limiting because they are environmentally unstable, similar to the antibodies in a way. The optimas are fairly stable, but again, you still need to refrigerate them. Again, we've done quite some bit of work on that. But my interest and in this presentation is to show you that you can actually use very, very stable types of polymers, what we refer to as responsive polymer hydrogels. And these are fairly well-known materials that change their shape and conformation if you expose them to different environmental stimuli. But also, if at all, you want to create even more versatile and yet robust type of platforms, you can create what they call the hybrid uh, metal organic frameworks where you can uh, create a hybrid system probably comprising of the responsive polymers and then you integrate, you know, things like the metal centers that are fairly useful, especially if at all you're doing electrochemical platforms. And I'm going to show you that you can actually create uh, the metal organic frameworks also by making them a bit more intelligent using the molecular imprinting method so that they can be very, very selective to whatever you are interested uh, in. Now, maybe the very first example that I'm going to show you is um, um, a, a planar micro needle platform uh, based on PDMS uh, that we developed to detect uh, pH as well as cortisol in human sweat, and we are doing that simultaneously. And very, very simply, you know, we fabricate uh, these micro needle platforms. I already said that we use a beeswax to create a PDMS micro needles, and then we print it with the carbon nanotubes so that we can have a conductive platform. And then we integrate uh, the polyaniline, which we just do simple radical polymerization. And it's fairly well known, you know, that polyaniline um, essentially is pH uh, responsive. Uh, because it uh, interconverts uh, between the meridine type of polyaniline and uh, these other oxidized form type of polyaniline if you expose it to hydronium ions. And so essentially, you know, we tested it, you know, to see if we can use it as a pH sensor. On the other hand, using the very same type of platform, and again, we are printing it, you know, um, next to each other, so in parallel, 
you know, we use exactly the same base, Micronido PDMS, printed it with the uh, carbon nanotubes and, um, and cellulose, which is carbon, um, rather, which is uh, cellulose nanocrystals. Again, it's, we are using that mainly as a binder, you know, so that the carbon nanotubes can print as a very, very thin film. And then we integrate again the polyaniline, as you're going to see, it's a conductive polymer, so it increases, you know, the conductivity of the entire platform, despite the fact that, of course, you know, you're also using it as a pH chamber. And we integrate on top of it, you know, the polymethacrylate uh, cortisol molecular imprinted polymer. And again, I've published this work, so you can check, you know, the details there, which is you take the glycide dimethaclarate uh, cross-linked with ethylene diamine dimethaclarate, and using radical polymerization, you know, you create those cavities, and then you extrude or extract uh, the template, you know, which is cortisol in this case, and we do so using electrochemical cleaning method. So the platforms looks like this, you know, at the microscope, you know, so you can see the micro needles. In this case, you can see the, um, the, the electrochemically cleaned um, MIP or molecularly imprinted uh, platform, you know, for cortisol detection. And you can actually see, you know, there's lots of porosity, you know, that is present, possibly, you know, resulting from the fact that we've electrochemically cleaned it. And so you can get, you know, um, you know, the cortisol actually getting trapped in some of those uh, por uh, pores. Now, the non-imprinted polymer, again, is just exactly the same type of monomers. The only difference is we don't integrate uh, the cortisol template. And again, you can see, despite the fact that it's actually cleaned, it doesn't have as many pores, you know, as a molecularly imprinted polymer surface. Now, when you look at it, you know, using the electrochemical impedance as expected, um, you're going to see that the moment you integrate uh, the cortisol MIP, the conductivity actually, uh, in, uh, the conductivity reduces, you know, because the cortisol MIP is actually a resistive material. But if you compare actually the MIP and the NIP, you know, the MIP is a little bit more, um, uh, more, 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 more conductive again, you know, because of those poles that are actually that are actually present. Now we also started those materials, you know, using um, electrochemistry, you know, by fitting them with the random cervix equation, so that we can map out the surface area. And these are the surface area, you know, of the different types of surfaces, you know, that one with pani, you know, that one with the molecularly imprinted polymer. And, and the numbers actually, you know, make sense, um, you, you, know, you know, based on, uh, based on the surface area, the porosities, you know, and so on. So we tested, um, you, you know, the PANI platform to check if it can respond uh, to pH response. And these ones are just the overlapped uh, cyclic vatamograms um, resulting from different exposing um, the, the patch, uh, the, the, the pH patch, you know, to different uh, pH uh, solutions. And, and you can see that you could actually, or we could actually generate a fairly nice calibration just by looking at or averaging um, the currents, which we convert to capacitance, actually, you know, in the voltage range around uh, minus 0 0.05 to around uh, zero. And then you can see, actually, you get a fairly decent uh, type of calibration, meaning that uh, the, the, the currents or the capacitance here, you know, are linearly responding to changes in the hydronium ion concentration and such, you know, you can actually use it uh, for pH sensing. Now we tested, you know, the MIP cortisol chamber, and again, you can see the overlap of thermograms as we are changing the concentrations of cortisol when we expose uh, the sensor to different concentrations. And similarly, you can see that, you know, in the voltage range, again, around uh, minus 0.5, average around there, again, you can see um, the capacitance actually linearly increasing, you know, with the concentration, again, meaning that you can actually use these types of platforms to detect, uh, to detect cortisol. Very quickly, you know, we actually expose these uh, sensors, both the pH chamber and the cortisol sensor uh, patch chamber, you know, to real sweat. And as you can see, actually, we could 
using standard addition, meaning we expose it to real sweat and then we incrementally spike it with incremental amounts of cortisol. And then you can see actually, you know, you would get a fairly decent calibration and by extrapolating it, um, the, 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 the normal way of calculating um, uh, uh, the, 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 the unknown when you're doing standard addition, we could actually detect the concentration of cortisol in the sweat you know, normal sweat, you know, that we actually used, um, which we calculated to be around 3.5 uh, nanograms uh, per mil. Now, the whole idea, you know, of all these, you know, is to hopefully use these types of platforms, you know, as wearables. And so we attached it, you know, to actually the, myself, you know, I took a run and, um, you know, sweat a little bit, and then actually we could, I could actually, you know, detect, you know, um, the, the, the amount of uh, pH, you know, that is present in sweat, you know, you can see the pH chamber sort of responds, because the pH in sweat is around, you know, five to six thereabout, you know, so there will be a response related to that, and on the other hand, you know, the cortisol sensor chamber, again, compared to the blank, you know, we would get, you know, a significant radical change, you know, in, um, in, in the cyclic vatamogram uh, uh, when the sensor was actually exposed to sweat. Now, take note of this, you know, that, we can, that the sensor is very, very stable, you know, we could reuse it. And, you know, this figure shows that, you know, we could actually um, recycle it, you know, up to 15 times, even much more, over 30 days. And the way we did this is, you know, you run the sensor and then we electrochemically clean it. And then after that, you know, we run a buffer and expose it to a certain amount of cortisol and again electrochemically clean it over 30 days. And again, you can see, you know, there's very good stability and the sensor doesn't, uh, doesn't degrade at all. Now, the, the other type of very quick type of sensor that we've tried to make, you know, is uh, using the stainless steel. Uh, this is a micro needle, and then we can use this uh, for detection of things like pH again, things like phosphate, nitrate, and so on. And this is why you just take the micro needle, and again, just like, you know, with the PDMS, we coat it with the carbon nanotubes, and then we coat it, for example, uh, you know, for detection of uh, the nitrate, you know, you would coat it with, um, with, with, with silver, and silver is fairly well known, you know, to be quite responsive to nitrate. And again, you know, we would coat uh, inside of the needle, um, you, you know, with pani for the pH sensing, and then we would coat um, um, the, the, the needle with what you call the um, ammonium molybdate, if at all we want to detect the phosphate. And again, you know, we found actually that uh, we could, it, it responds very well. In this case, you can see very good calibration for the pH response using these uh, stainless steel micro needles. Um, for the nitrates again, you can see we got a very, very good response again in the voltage range around 0 to minus 0.5 when we use this type of needle. And again, you can see very, very good response. And with the phosphate uh, using the ammonium molybdate, it's fairly well known in the literature, you know, you could get, you know, these again, very good calibration um, that, that is resulting when we expose these microneeders, you know, to nitrous, meaning that you can actually use it, you know, to detect, um, uh, to detect, sorry, in this case, this is phosphate, to detect phosphates, you know, in, um, in, in, uh, in a sample. So we tried to analyze uh, a real sample, you know, such as coffee. And, and again, we were able, you know, to use the different types of micro needles, stainless steel micro needle sensors to detect nitrates, to detect phosphates, and to detect the pH. And we actually compared them, you know, with the commercial platforms, and they give very, very, uh, very, very similar type of results. For example, for the commercial pH, when you expose it to a real coffee, you know, you get a pH of about 5.4. And using our platform, Microneedle Sensor, we could analyze um, the same coffee to get a 5.6. The phosphates, again, very, very similar within about 3%. Uh, you, uh, when you, you, you analyze the coffee using the commercial calorimetric kit, 
and so on. And so, so, so actually you can see that, um, you know, these types of very inexpensive, you know, micro need platforms that are, that, that, that are very good, you know, to analyze um, real samples uh, as well. And similarly, you know, they are very, very stable uh, and, and you can reuse them just by electrochemically cleaning them and they remain stable, you know, over a very long period of time. And now because of time, you know, I wouldn't uh, go into all those details, but maybe one last slide is to show you that you can actually use these types of micro needles, not only for electrochemistry, but you can also use them, you know, for chromatography because they're actually very similar, you know, to the solid phase micro extraction platforms. And so you can actually, you know, throw it into the GC and if at all you want to verify something after doing the electrochemistry, you can insert it, you know, into the GC platform and actually do the analysis uh, that way. But of course, you're using, you, you know, um, a, a chemical species that's amenable for analysis by GCMS, such as caffeine, which we've done a lot of work with and compared actually those types of micro needle platforms with the commercial SPME. And actually it works almost the same, only that our platform doesn't break at all even if you use it, you know, for a very, very long time on the GCMS platform. So you can see the robustness, you know, of these platforms, not only for electrochemistry, you know, electrochemical sensors, you know, but also, you know, you can use them uh, to, uh, to verify what you've analyzed using electrochemistry, you know, by chromatography. And again, because of time, I'm going to leave it at that, you know, by acknowledging the people who've done the work, you know, my students, most of the work that I've talked about was done by Wei Ha Lu, who's a research associate in my group, and also Marika Wood as well. In fact, Marika Wood is presenting, um, you know, so you can look at her presentation later. And uh, thank you for your attention.